Hi Nick, how are you? Hi, good, thank you. <laughs> so, I'm so excited to talk to you again. It's so funny because it's been one month since I spoke to you um, on my podcast, Crypto Native, and then... I feel like we had a really great conversation and now one month later, I'm the community manager at <laughs> ANS. <laughs> so that's been really incredible for me. And I feel like in the month that I've been at ANS, something that I have discovered from being on the team that I didn't know as just a user of, of ANS and as Alicia.eth on Twitter is kind of just how much has gone into building ANS and the story behind it. And so I was really excited to well, I am really excited to talk to you a lot about the early days of ENS and just everything that you've been through because I feel like in the last couple of months, as you know, dot eth names on Twitter have really taken off, and I feel like we're kind of reaching some sort of tipping point uh, with ENS, and so uh, I feel like uh, something that would be really valuable for the whole community would be to just learn a bit more about how everything started, and because it feels you know, like a lot of fun if you're joining the community like in the last couple of months. But I feel like for you, maybe it's been a really kind of maybe not so long, but, you know, definitely a journey. So I wonder just going all the way back to um, you joining the Ethereum Foundation and kind of that time in your life, like what was that like? And and kind of what what did you feel so excited about with Ethereum in general that kind of made you take that leap? I guess, uh, I mean, it was a little intimidating because all of my my professional experience prior to then had been full-time employment and suddenly I was taking the leap to uh, to being a contractor, to working remotely where I was the only person in my city like working for the EF, uh, to, uh, you know, and that city was London, so not exactly a small <laughs> one, um, to, to, you know, honestly like taking a big pay cut as well, um, which which I all did though because I was I was really, really excited about Ethereum. And I guess it comes from, uh, like, I'm, I'm a huge nerd. Uh, <laughs> and and I really like computer science and I really like software and I love the theoretical sort of fundamentals underlying it. And I remember so many times, like, playing around with this sort of thing, uh, you know, with, with just, like, low-level computer stuff growing up and thinking about, mm -hmm. like, how cool would it be if you could have, like, this this global computer that people could program? And, like, people rubbish the whole, you know, world computer thing because it was mm -hmm. fairly missold in terms of what people understood it to mean. But the idea that you can have this execution environment where everybody knows that programs execute the same way and have the same result and have that run in a way that's, that's sort of universal and uh, doesn't... Uh, require any sort of trusted third party. Uh, that was really exciting. Like I'd, I'd looked into Bitcoin a couple of times, like years before, and been like, oh, you know, kind of cool, but doesn't seem very scalable. And uh, you know, it's just money. Like it's just moving money around. It didn't seem that interesting to me. But then with Ethereum coming along with like programmability and the yeah. ability to like build your own consensus systems in it that I thought was really exciting. And so I basically started playing with it as soon as I found out about it. Uh, and it only took, I think, like a couple of months after that before I, I got a call from the EF saying, would you like to come join the EF, uh, you know, and and work on either uh, Go Ethereum or, or Swarm. Um, and so I sort of, after a short hesitation about the nature of like giving up the certainty of a full-time job, uh, made the plan, took the plunge. Wow. And what year was that? Uh, that was 2016. Wow. Okay. And so in terms of what led to that call, was that just you creating projects and like working in public and like pushing your code? Pretty much. Yeah. I think the <laughs> thing that attracted attention um, most was I wrote a really early Solidity string manipulation library. Uh, and prior to that, there were like a few sort of ad hoc functions people had coded up but nothing you know slightly more coherent uh so so i put that out and it gained some popularity and i think that attracted some attention wow okay so that's really interesting that kind of whether you are non-technical in the space like me kind of creating content or whether you are technical and um and, and creating code that it works the same way that kind of proof of work in the space works the same way so i think that's really cool um so 
okay, that's really exciting. And so then you're at, at the Ethereum Foundation in 2016. And like, how many people are in that team? Or um... uh, So I, I was initially working on the Swarm team, uh, which was probably about four of us, I think, maybe five. Mm-hmm. And I, after a short period, I switched over to the Go Ethereum team, which was a similar size. In fact, I think it was just three of us at one point. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, they were fairly small teams, and the EF itself was was a lot smaller, mm-hmm. um, you know, although still bigger than like ENS is today, I think. Right. Yeah, I think that is one of the most shocking things, learning that the ENS team has kind of done so much with so few people. But I think that speaks volumes about the, the people that who who are already on the team, especially yourself. So, uh, okay, so then you're happy working on at the Ethereum Foundation, everything's going really well, and you're, like, fulfilling your childhood dreams. Um, (laughs) (laughs) And then then how does ENS kind of come about? So one of the first things I worked on when, uh, you know, when I joined the Swarm team was Mm -hmm. they needed some sort of naming system because... Uh, you know, they were publishing content to, to Swarm, or that was their intention, and they needed a way for people to access it in a like a human readable fashion. You know, big long identifiers weren't weren't good enough, and so one of the first things I picked up was that. And my very early first version was uh, based on DNS, more or less. Mm-hmm. It was it was quite closely mirrored DNS, um, and it was I was sort of seeking to address this this inadequacy that like there had been a couple of attempts at naming things on Ethereum, but they were all extremely basic. They were you know you you can have a name and it points to the account that owns it, and that was it. There were no subdomains. There was no ability to like uh, have it point at multiple different types of resources or to like uh, have it point at a different address than the one that controls it and so forth. Um, you know, it was very, very limited. And so I wanted to build something more extensible. Um, and so I left the Swarm team, but I kept working on uh, the naming system, uh, you know, even after to moving to the Geth team. And the second revision was pretty much what you see today in, in ENS. So it kept the extensibility uh, and the, the flexibility and the sort of the permissionlessness, the fact that you don't need some central upgrade to enable some new feature. Um, but it uh, it restructured the system to fit better with the constraints of Ethereum rather than the constraints of 1980s computers that were first connected to the internet. <laughs> yeah, and so when you're thinking about things like <clears throat> now, you know, if you start from this point where you're using DNS and, and that system to, to build ENS, uh, but then how does that kind of play out because I feel like it's lasted really well. Like that original idea that you had um, has really stood the test of time so far. And so are you thinking like very long term when you're thinking about things or is it like a very iterative kind of step where you're just like, okay, let's just solve for this problem, human readable names so that the Swarm team can use them. Or are you really thinking about like this could be, ENS could be the DNS of the blockchain when you start it? <laughs> uh, I mean, I guess, yeah, I guess, you know, DNS of the blockchain seemed like a reasonable uh, a reasonable thing to build for and like my goal is always to build a system that's simple but extensible you know that that it it meets its goals with as little additional complexity as possible but it allows for for later expansion and so forth and so you know the 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 key thing in ENS was that we have the central registry which is is not really upgradable but it just does a very simple mapping step it just lets you look up who is the what is the contra- contract that's responsible for this name and then everything else builds in is built into that contract and so that means that uh, you can add features just because you own a name you don't need to upgrade the whole system like most most things require <clears throat> and so adding that sort of layer of indirection, that one additional step, mm-hmm. gives you all that flexibility without a lot of complexity. And I like that's always what I try and uh, work towards if I'm building something new that I, I want to last. Yeah. Wow. Okay, that's really exciting. And I, I suppose that also just opens the door in terms of the potential ENS ecosystem because the you know the number of times, I can't imagine how many DMs you get of people sliding into your DM saying, is is ENS doing this? And is your reply? I feel like my reply now is now, um, the core team isn't doing that, but we would love for someone in the, in the community to build that. That's the point, that it's open and, and anyone can extend it in any way. Absolutely, yeah. And I, I guess I'd say like we've made more changes to the, 
uh, the the permissioned part of ENS, you know, the, the bit that requires like somebody to to upgrade things, um, than I anticipated when I first launched. But mm-hmm. the vast majority of the changes that have been made, either by us or by someone else, have been, uh, you know, done without anybody's central permission or approval or anything like that. And so it's mm-hmm. it largely works the way it is intended. And yeah, I get a lot of DMs and typically <laughs> my answer is exactly what you say. <laughs> yeah. Is there anything that you're really looking forward to being built, uh, kind of using or integrating ENS in this space? Uh, so I guess the, the thing I, I, I really uh, love seeing stuff built on subdomains and, and so mm-hmm. forth. And, uh, you know, anything around that, because it lets you create your own sort of sub ecosystem that can have whatever rules and permissions you want. Uh, and we're releasing soon some, some something called a name wrapper, which allows for making that sort of thing a lot easier. Uh, so I'd be really excited to see what people build on top of that once they, they have to write less code themselves and can rely on sort of standard building blocks more. Mm-hmm. The subdomain name wrapper is something I'm so excited about. Someone just uh, commented in the Discord yesterday and they said, I listened to Brantley on a Twitter spaces talking about subdomains and I get it like, you know, that everything can have a subdomain like every. And I was like, yes, you get it. You see it like every, not only every person, like as Brantley says in the known universe, um, but every object, like everything, if like literally everything could have a subdomain which is so exciting and it's really interesting thinking in such an expansive way I wonder how like having been in the space now for many years is that your default to think very um like courageously I guess (laughs) (laughs) well I guess like my attitude towards building systems is to make them as extensible and and uh long lasting as possible but my attitude to actually launching things is to assume that they probably won't work um <laughs> so so i try and build a system that will will do really well if it's massively successful but i've lost track of the number of like cool little projects i've put out that just haven't got traction so kind of a, a hybrid of both i guess yeah okay cool cool, cool. and so when um ens is deemed to be kind of more than a side project and something that you can spend all of your time on what does that look like in terms of i I mean we know how it would work in web 2 or in kind of a traditional tech environment where you might go out and get funding and then you have money to pay yourself and bring on some team members and build this thing how did it work with ens in this ecosystem uh, so it sort of it gradually took up more and more of my time while I was still on the Geth team, uh, and I sort of you know did that with the the approval of like uh, you know my boss on the Geth team, and also with you know the approval of like the the director of the EF. Um, but eventually, it got to the point where I wasn't really doing much or any Geth work, and it was pretty much all ENS stuff. Um, and the EF at the time was like sort of going through some some changes in terms of like trying to decide how they should handle decentralization. Mm-hmm. And so their suggestion was like, uh, you know, basically, I think I'd already asked, you know, could could we have like a team? You know, could I actually have like an ENS team uh, and headcount and stuff? And they basically said, well, maybe not, but we're working towards decentralizing more and one of the things we're considering is to like spin out successful ENS projects into their own organizations so how about we uh you know do make ENS the guinea pig for this basically you know you write us up a proposal uh spin out into a a new not-for-profit organization and we'll write you a grant check to get you started uh and you know who knows maybe more grant checks later depends how you do really um and so I did that. I wrote up a proposal. I figured out uh, like there were a couple of of core contributors who had been volunteering their time or who had done some some work on uh, you know very low remuneration basis because it was all I could sort of afford at the time. Um, who I thought would make excellent sort of founding members of an independent DNS team. And so I asked them, and I wrote up a proposal, and I figured out what I thought like would be you know sort of I think it was like 18 months or two years worth of runway and I submitted it and I said you know here's what I want uh, can you give us half a million dollars and I was like oh my god I'm asking for a lot of money <laughs> um, and apparently it went all the way to Vitalik who looked at it and said this is entirely inappropriate half a million dollars isn't nearly enough and they gave us a million instead <sighs> um, 
So, you know, it wasn't like no strings attached. We had like goals to meet in order to get each part of the grant and stuff like that. And, you know, it was very sensible in terms of like making sure we actually did something with the money rather than just sat on our butts. Um, mm-hmm. But it was it was very generous and it was instrumental in getting ENS like running and viable as a as an independent organization. Uh, so then we, yeah, we started being a, a separate organ and, and setting our own goals. Um, and that also meant that we could uh, we could pick our own targets. You know, we'd, we'd still try and meet the things in the, the grant goals, but mm-hmm. to, to sort of decide how we wanted to approach it. Yeah, and it's really interesting now hearing that story about the EF and the proposal and the grant with ENS and now, you know, what just happened with ENS and EF getting together to do the proposal and a grant for sign with Ethereum. Mm-hmm. And so I wonder just as a way of doing things, of kind of bringing projects to life and getting giving people a pathway to kind of do the work, how do you feel about that kind of process in general? I think it can be it, pros and cons, really, because it can be quite high overhead. Uh, you know, I think we, ENS team got off quite lightly on this because there was already sort of uh, inertia in the organization, like momentum in the EF to do this and to get us into our own org. So it was a relatively straightforward process. Mm-hmm. But from what I've seen of grant issuing, like both at the EF and elsewhere in general, like where somebody comes with a whole new idea, there can be a lot of overhead and a lot of time involved in getting to the point of actually having the funding for it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there's ideas like, you know, retroactive grants, you know, where you basically somebody builds something cool and then you go, you deserve to be paid for this and you pay them for it, which I think is an awesome idea. But it also has its own like drawbacks because it means that only the people who can afford to actually dedicate the time to building it without, ex- you know, external money end up building stuff. So I don't know if there's a an ideal solution because there's also like there's a lot of sort of easy money sloshing around you know, and, and there's also a lot of people who will promise the, the world and, and not deliver a lot. So you don't want to be, oh, yeah, just anybody comes to us with a great idea and we'll write you a check because then you end right. up wasting it, you know. So it's, it's a really difficult problem. Yeah, it almost seems like it needs to be an ecosystem solution because no one party or organisation can take on kind of dealing with all of the different angles of trying to solve this problem and so yeah yeah i think so and i think like any organization that's doing this there's a tendency to be quite conservative and to be afraid of wasting money and to say Mm -hmm. you know and and to add all these extra barriers and and uh, bureaucracy to getting a grant to try and prevent ever giving it to someone who won't deliver um, but I think it's it's worth recognizing that there are costs to that as well. So you're not trying to be in a position where you never, ever give out a grant that isn't well spent. You're trying to balance the cost of poorly spent grants against the cost of not giving grants to organizations that could have made a huge difference. Um, yeah. So it's difficult, but it's it, people need to recognize it's a balance, not just a, you know, all the way over here at the extreme. Yeah, I had a, a really good... Um, way of thinking about this recently on a podcast and basically this person said that they like to believe in people and give people kind of the benefit of the doubt and um, give them all of the responsibility and, and things like that and the ownership and then it's accepted that some people will not deliver or, or will let you down and they just think about that as like a single digit tax on the like the huge upside potential of just like being very kind of generous and optimistic as a baseline. <laughs> yep, I, I pretty much agree with that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So uh, having the grant to get started and then having a team, I I wonder in terms of you know where ENS started as like the intention with the human readable um, mapping a human readable name to a wallet address to where it is now. I feel like where this idea of a web three identity has really um, taken hold of um, not the narrative of ENS, but I I think that that people really identify with this idea of identity in web three now. So what has that been like in terms of like the, what you're thinking about within the ENS team to seeing how the ecosystem and the community respond to it and, and what, how they see it. Mm. So the in, interestingly, like the first use case for ENS wasn't actually wallet address at all. It was a swarm hash 
for looking oh, up right. swan content. Uh, and pretty much from, from day one, I was like, well, obviously this would be really good as a way to identify wallets as well. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, I, I always thought that wallet addresses would get penetration faster and, and more effectively than, than Swarm or any other decentralized content thing. But right from day one, we had the idea that it could be used to, to address multiple resources. Uh, and, you know, the two that we had in mind initially were wallet addresses and distributed content. Um, but, you know, although I sort of, I built it to be extensible and I hope people would use it for a variety of things, I didn't really foresee the, the expansion of importance of uh, you know, as an identity and, and so forth. And particularly, like, I built in reverse resolution, which we're now calling a, a primary ENS name. Mm -hmm. uh, the idea is that you can look up an account and say, you know, which name is associated with this, as opposed to the regular process where you start with a name and get an account. Um, I built it in almost as an afterthought because I was like, well, we're modeling after DNS. DNS has this. It's not used much in DNS, but it is occasionally useful. Um, so I should build it in, you know, because it, it'll be useful from time to time. Uh, and I didn't really foresee just how uh, how useful it would be, because it, which I should have, because you look at a page, a site like Etherscan, and mm -hmm. it's just pages of addresses, and being able to turn that into to something that's recognizable immediately is is really valuable. Yeah. Wow. That's and so can you just talk me through reverse records as a concept because I feel like it is very groundbreaking for a lot of people to wrap their head around. Mm -hmm. And um so yeah, how how does that work? So at its most basic the idea is like if you own an ENS name you can point it at an address. So then when somebody enters the ENS name into their into a wallet or whatever, it will resolve to that address, meaning you can send funds to it, you can look it up for to see account details or whatnot. Reverse resolution or, or primary ENS name is the reverse of that, as the name implies. So the idea is you start with an account address, which maybe you got from an explorer or you were looking up a transaction history or somebody signed in with it or whatever, anywhere where they wouldn't have been manually typing it in. Um, and instead, you want to show something human readable to the people viewing your app. So you have like a sign in widget in the corner and you want to show them their ENS name. But somebody can own multiple ENS names and they can point at multiple accounts and so on. So you need a way to say, this is the name I want to be associated with this account. Like, you know, there are, there are many, but this is the one that I see as my primary identity. And so that's what you can do here to say, you know, to, to pick a name that points at your address and say, this is the one I should be identified by. Yeah. Okay. Wow, that's that's really exciting. And starting to see uh, dApps using it, like being able to sign into uh, like one inch or Uniswap um, and and Showtime and things like that. And to to see the like your ENS identity in action is really exciting. And I know that we just released the um, NFT avatar, like being able to see your <coughs> avatar as a, an NFT, which is is really exciting. And it's making it all feel very. Um, Web3 native, which is really interesting. And, and I wonder in terms of thinking about ENS, because I feel like it is the most kind of crypto native um, evolution of identity compared to, even though you started with DNS, I, I feel like potentially there um, is a, a window to try to just replicate DNS for Web3 um, and these kind of web two ideas, but I feel like ENS goes further than that. And I wonder in terms of what, sh what makes ENS so crypto native, is it, is it kind of your time spent here and the team's time spent here? Or do you think it's just the community? Like, I wonder um, how ENS kind of just stays out ahead of everything. <laughs> um, it's, it's a bit of both, I think, um, you know, the, the we've try, always tried to focus on the features and, and so forth that are actually really useful to people mm -hmm. um, and to try and, you know, not be so fixated on our own vision of what ENS should be that, that we miss like what people are actually using it for. Mm -hmm. So I think it's been driven by, you know, the community and then us like picking up on what's actually useful from, from the community and, and building on that is, has been really valuable. Yeah. Yeah. And I wonder just kind of thinking about the community and looping back to dot ETH, dot ETH names and especially on Twitter, what I know that we we mentioned in our previous conversation that you were probably the first person to see your dot ETH name on Twitter. <laughs> I, I'm pretty sure I was. I uh, originally it was like you know Nick Johnson in brackets Nick dot ETH, uh, mm -hmm. and I'm pretty sure I was the first person to do that. Yeah, 
And so what do you think it is? So I actually just gifted, had my first ENS fairy moment, which was really great for me, and gifted a friend their name, Do'eth, and mm-hmm. they just changed their Twitter name to it. And uh, I remember watching Validated Do'eth do it earlier this year on Twitch streams and on Twitter and things like that. And it really just completely exemplified to me everything that was so wonderful and wholesome about this community Mm -hmm. and so i wonder for you like what does the dot eighth twitter name kind of represent and why do you think it's captured hearts and minds on twitter like it has (laughs) it's it's kind of blown me away because initially like just to me it was it was a practical thing of saying like hey i'm using Mm -hmm. ens here's my ens identity like if you want to interact with it in some way um and also just you know a little bit of an advertisement you know saying (laughs) you know, for ENS. Um, but it's it's really taken over because I think it's uh it's very it serves multiple purposes. Like it's a very mm-hmm. easy and evocative signal that, hey, I use Ethereum and, you know, that that I, I want to associate that with my identity. And at the same time it's a practical handle that you can use to identify the the person's public persona. Um so I guess it's just that combination of like Uh, in-group signaling and actually useful asset uh, is what's driven it. But I've been enormously surprised by how far it's spread. And, you know, there there was a period there where we were seeing people who were, like, uh, setting it as their handle because all they saw was other people setting it as their handle, but they didn't understand that it was actually associated with this thing called ENS and that you had to register a name. Uh, So they would just, like, pick their name and add .eth and... Uh, oh, right. you know, so it's, it took a while for our communication around that to catch up with the actual <laughs> spread of the meme, you know. <laughs> well, yeah, actually I have, um, when, when I do see people with the .eth name, um, especially if they're new to Web3, I sometimes do a quick check um, just to make sure that they have it and then send them a kind DM saying, you know, you, you can also buy this on any, so you actually <laughs> own <laughs> the .eth. <laughs> yeah. um, and so uh, in terms of, I guess, all of the mechanisms that are in place with ENS, um, especially uh, because people who are buying .eth names, in a lot of instances, it is one of the first things that you do uh, when you kind of make that commitment to Web3 and crypto. Um, and so kind of having an understanding of all of the yeah mechanisms at play with ENS, I, I think it's really useful. And I feel like what, a lot of questions that we get kind of from the community are around pricing and um, just maybe how the pricing, like the different experiments that you've done with pricing over the last couple of years and um, and then also kind of how you the team have landed with the mechanisms that they have in place. So I wonder if you could just give us like a brief history of like how that all evolved. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so the, the original system was based on an auction and it was, uh, you know, largely as a result of discussions between Alex van der Sand and me, and he was a very strong proponent of not just the auction model, but also of, of uh, locked deposits, which is what we used in the initial version. So mm-hmm. uh, right back at the very start in 2017, uh, names were released uh, progressively, and as each name became avail- available, it started an auction process uh, using something called a Vickery auction. Uh, you would put down your bid, uh, during the auction period and then during the reveal period you'd reveal it and whoever won would get the name uh, but they would only pay as much as the second highest bidder which is what makes it a Vickery auction mm-hmm. uh, and then that amount wasn't like given to the team or or burned or anything it was locked up in an account that was held there for as long as you retained the name so the idea was that it provided a sort of a constant incentive to release the name if you no longer needed it because you'd get your money back Right. Um, and in some ways, that was kind of quite premature, uh, like it was very early. Uh, these days, if you did something like that, you would be able to do things like uh, you'd have services that would like uh, pay for your deposit for you in return right. for like a monthly fee uh, because they would, you know, uh, that that basically be staking for you. Uh, and you'd have services that would let you borrow against your deposit and, uh, you know, and so on and so forth. Um and the system, like, the, the goal was was good, but we sort of discovered the, the unintended side effect of this, really, is that it effectively made it cheaper for speculators and squatters than it did for legitimate users. Because if you, if I bought Nick.eth, not that it was available back then, but for a deposit of one ETH, 
I have to assume that deposit is gone forever because I don't want to ever release Nick Dot ETH and get my you know to get my one ETH back. Right. Uh, and of course, if the price of ETH skyrockets, that might seem like a much less reasonable price than it did at the time when it was thirty bucks or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, on the other hand, if I'm a speculator, uh, I am intending to flip the name, and when I flip the name, I get paid off, and I can reasonably expect the person buying it will pay more than the deposit because they could always release it for that. And so, therefore, my capital is only locked up for as long as I'm sitting on the inventory. Effectively, it has you know very very low cost for me. And right. so that was very much an unintended effect, um, and and that became apparent in time. And so uh, the other issue was like the usability, like the auction system made a lot of sense for initial release of the name. And I'm a big fan of systems that ensure fair allocation of of new assets. Mm-hmm. But after the initial auction period, it didn't make a lot of sense to have to wait five days to register any an S name when you're almost certainly the only one trying to register that name because right. you know, the chances of multiple people wanting it at the same time are quite low. Um, so, uh, you know, I think it was two years on because uh, we, we announced right on day one that this was going to be the interim system and two years in we would aim to replace it. So two years in we replaced it with the current system, which is mm-hmm. basically instant registration and an annual fee, uh, which is very similar to how DNS works. and. Right. Uh, you know, a little disappointing in some ways because we tried all these innovative things and we worked for all these things and we ended up coming back to a very sort of ordinary system. <laughs> um, but it has the advantage that it makes it more expensive for people to just buy names and sit on them and not use them while keeping the cost quite low for people who just want a name to name their project. Um, and then the third thing we did in terms of pricing was we made another couple of changes. One was we released names that were shorter. So initially the limit was seven characters or more. We made three, four, five, and six character names available. And for three and four character names, there's a substantial premium just because there's so few of those names that, that are available. Um, and then the other thing we did was uh, when names were names were coming up for expiry, and we didn't want a situation where we had gas wars over popular names that were expiring. So right. we set up what, what's called a temporary premium, which is another sort of auction, basically. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a Dutch auction. So when a name expires, um, it becomes available. But if you want to register it straight away, there's a premium which starts at $2,000. And that diminishes to zero over a period of a couple of weeks. So if you want to wait, you can wait until it's the normal price. If you think it's worth a bit extra, you can get it then. But the idea is that it makes it uh, available to to you when it's a good price for you, rather than rewarding somebody who writes a bot that like snaps it up the very second it's available. Right. Yeah. I my first exposure to uh, ENS was looking for Alicia.eth, and when I saw it, it um, had dropped into um, this temporary premium state and was on an auction and coming down and I thought it was the coolest thing. I, I know though that people f- can feel that it, it can feel very unfair for a user to see like a name that is available for registration um, jump straight to $2,000 um, and then kind of go down to the normal price for over 28 days. But I wonder just kind of digging into that idea of um, of basically being an incentive for utility rather than speculation. And uh, in terms of, you know, people writing um, scripts for bots or writing bots to pick up names, is that like a, a real threat and, and does that happen? Uh, I think it's a real threat. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, we, we see it a lot with systems that haven't designed with this in mind. Like the obvious example is NFT drops. Right. Um, it isn't something we've seen a lot for ENS because we've taken a lot of precautions to try and discourage it. Yeah. Um, you know, with the, the the reason registering a name takes two transactions instead of one mm-hmm. is, is because we were concerned that with just one, somebody would front run registrations. So they would see an incoming registration, they'd grab the name before you could grab it, and then they'd offer it up to sale to you at an inflated price. And they wouldn't even have to be successful most of the time if they they offer it for 10 times the normal price and they get rejected like eight times out of 10 they're still doubling their money you know um so i think these are these are real risks and i think that people that design systems that run on ethereum and the blockchain without thinking about them will uh, get wrecked eventually (laughs) you know if not immediately or their users will rather which is worse yeah well i think this is really interesting because it kind of brings to the forefront this idea that 
an ENS name is an NFT, which is very easy to forget because I think the one-to-one comparison is that it's like a domain name, um, but for Web3. But really, an NFT is very, very different to a domain name. So I wonder in terms of what is so exciting about the fact that ENS is an NFT um, and I know we've kind of touched on this with subdomains and the name wrapper, but how how do you think about that and, and why is that so exciting? Uh, I guess like the, the obvious thing to come, that comes to mind, but in my mind the most boring, <laughs> is the fact that you can trade them like other NFTs. Mm-hmm. They show up in OpenSea and so on, but that seems kind of, of trivial and, and not that interesting to me. The, the thing that I find most exciting is that they're composable. Uh, so you know and that they they interf- implement the same interface, so you can you can transfer them on a bridge to an L two, you can use them in a, a game or or anything that uses you know NFT items, uh, you can uh, you know compose them with other NFTs and collections and so forth. Uh, you know one thing that came up recently is there's this the thing called the guild that's doing an alpha and they support NFTs, which means they support ENS. Mm-hmm. So you can create a chat channel that's only for people with ENS names or only for people with short ENS names. And all of these things, like neither we nor the guild had to do any special support for that because they were able to just grab the stuff that we, we have because it's already directly supported uh, because it's an NFT. Mm-hmm. So that's what I think is, is coolest about it is just the fact it's an open ecosystem and it's a common protocol that everything uses. Yeah. And I wonder just quickly in terms of the NFT standards, can you just run through where ENS is, like what an ENS name is at the moment and then what that, how that might mm-hmm. change in the future? So at the moment, uh, ENS names like in the registry mm-hmm. are not an, like they're our own standard because it was actually written before NFTs existed. Wow. Um, and so they're still really, they're a type of NFT, but it's specific to ENS. Mm-hmm. Uh, .eth names are ERC721 NFTs, which are the sort most people are familiar with, Mm -hmm. Um, but that only applies to .eth names that are second level domains. So nick.eth is is an ERC721 NFT, Uh, buy.nick.eth is not, it's a subdomain. Um, And so then finally there's the wrapper, uh, which we're planning to release, and that will allow wrapping any name at any level into an NFT. Uh, and that'll be an 1155 NFT, which is a newer sort and, in my opinion, better standard for NFTs. Um, and that means that like any name can be an NFT. And you can also set things up so that, uh, for instance, you could own wallet.eth and you could give out subdomains of wallet.eth, which would be NFTs, mm-hmm. but also that you can't claw back off the people you sold them to. So you can people can be sure that they're actually going to continue to own that name. Wow. I feel like that is really exciting. It's like this idea that things that you could come together in community, but that could also be viewed as like a point of centralization, but that Mm -hmm. it is still kind of trustless in the sense that the ultimate holder of the ENS name couldn't rug the users with subdomains. So I feel like this is so exciting to think about like the the bun- bundling and unbundling of power um, and how it's still the user still retains so much power um, mm-hmm. with this kind of yeah with with this standard yeah and like I, I love the idea of how you can combine these things too mm-hmm. so you could write a contract that, that issues subdomains of, of your domain.eth and then you could set up a guild chat channel so that the only people who are allowed in it are people who are in subdomains so then now your your contract on ethereum governs the membership of a discord channel um, you know, and also the, the everybody gets a name into the bargain. I think that's really cool. Yeah. I feel like as well, when you say subdomains, you know, we think of subdomains as you could just have it like a few things that are subdomains, but my mind has started ticking about so many things in my life, just with my own uh, .eth name, with my own ENS name, that could be a subdomain. And so I feel like in terms of thinking <laughs> really creatively about uses for subdomains, is there anything that kind of really excites you? I know that, you know, Brantley uses, um, can use them for family members and, and things like that. So first name, last name. And but I don't know, what's on your mind with what could be done? Uh, well, so as part of our L2 stuff, we're working on uh, wildcard support. And with the wildcard support, all sorts of subdomain things become possibilities. So, uh, you know, an exchange could give out ENS names for every user. So you'd be like your username dot exchange dot ETH. Um, but you could also do things like you could create a, a name so that 
every every numeric subdomain refers to a specific NFT token. So, yeah. uh, you know, one two three dot punk dot ETH could refer to punk number one two three, or it could refer to the owner of punk number one two three. So, if you own punk one two three, you could just say, oh yeah, send me a token at one two three dot punk dot ETH. Um, you know, you, you can do even wilder things like. Uh, there's the system called uh, the sort of broadly speaking two types of naming systems. There's, mm-hmm. there's objective naming systems like ENS, where everybody has the same view of all the names, mm-hmm. and there's pet naming systems or subjective naming systems where I decide what I'm going to call a bunch of accounts, and you decide what you're going to call them, and so on. Um, but in pet naming systems, you can also sort of take that a step further. I could go like, uh, you know, I call your account Alicia, and you call Vitalik's account Vitalik. But maybe I don't have a record for that. I could go like Vitalik.Alicia, which is like look up the person who Alicia calls Vitalik. Oh my gosh. Um, and so Whoa. you could build something like yeah, you could build something <laughs> like that in ENS using subdomains, you know, so you just nest them and it automatically resolves one after the other, sort of thing. Wow, I just like had that was funny, it was like seeing the idea land in real time. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, but okay, that, that's really, oh my goodness. I'm not, I'm not ready for this. I'm like just wrapping my head around, uh, web three identity and getting really excited about that. But as soon as we drop that, um, subdomain wrapper, um, feature, I think that kind of, I'm, I'm so excited to see what people do with that. And I wonder as well, just with NFTs and, uh, I feel like you maybe have a, a general interest and curiosity when it comes to like NFTs. And I've noticed that you collect, um, a few uh, a few pieces yourself and so how yeah what is that like for you being a collector and what's your interest in it um yeah i mean i, I don't collect that much but a bit like sort of whatever mm-hmm. whatever interests me yeah um i i got involved in nfts a bit right back at the very start because i was an active eip editor uh at the time and the um uh the team behind crypto kitties were trying to standardize standardize uh, you know, a standard for NFTs. And I got involved in like offering feedback and commentary on that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then after they, when they were launching CryptoKitties, they offered like a bug bounty. And so I guess I could probably rightly say that I was like the first person ever paid a bounty for finding a bug in an NFT contract. Wow. <laughs> um, for, for which they gave me like some some trivial amount of ether that I forget, but also like a limited edition kitty. Um <laughs> Uh, and so, yeah, I've, I've had some involvement right from the very beginning, but mm-hmm. not like, you know, I'm not a heavy duty collector or anything. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've picked up things that interest me. I've, I've got a few Ether cards because Ether cards was originally a project of my own doing something totally different that I, I sold to a comba uh, because I didn't have time to, to manage it on my own. Um, you know, I, I've got a few other things that just like where I particularly like the creators or I particularly like the art or something like that. Mm-hmm. I do feel like a lot of it is out of reach even to someone like me who's been native to it for a long time. Like unless I prepared to invest, you know, ridiculous amounts of money in it, um, it does feel like a lot of it is, is quite stratospheric at the moment. Yeah. And I, I wonder just in terms of kind of thinking about the amounts of money and, you know, seeing everything represented as an ethereum like price uh, when you're transacting uh and just taking into account gas wars and just gas prices in general at the moment how do you like what do you think about kind of the state of gas's impact on adoption and just general use i think it's it's reached the point where it's it's i think it's impacting a lot of things that would be good uses for Ethereum, but are no longer economically feasible. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, we, we're not going to have the the whole, you know, Ethereum isn't going to turn into a ghost town, you know, it's the, the, the saying of like, oh, nobody goes there, it's too busy, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> but it's definitely hedging out the things that would be more affordable for people in favour of the higher value things. Mm-hmm. And I do think that's a shame. But at the same time, we're getting L2s are becoming more practical, roll-ups and, and other uh, efforts around that. Uh, so hopefully those things will start migrating to those systems. And I'm really encouraged that some of those systems don't make enormous trade-offs in favor of centralization in order to get more throughput. Like they, they're managing to remain very decentralized and trustless while still massively increasing their transaction capacity. Yeah. And then ENS's position on L2s, I've heard you talk about it, but can you just kind of give me an, uh, like a snapshot of where that's at? 
Yep. So for the foreseeable future, the ENS registry, like the core component, will, will be on Ethereum. Mm -hmm. But the goal is, first of all, to enable it, uh, to make it possible to uh, move subdomains or move domains and all their subdomains to the L2 or external system of your choice. So if you register wallet.eth and you want to hand out subdomains, you could hand out subdomains on Optimism or on Arbitrum or on any other system um, and therefore do so with, with minimal or no gas fees mm -hmm. for your users. And your users could then set ENS records and so forth again without paying any L1 gas fees. So the idea is that for the majority of users, they should have minimal costs using ENS. Um, longer term, we may move like .eth itself, we could move to an L2 so that uh, you can register .eth names for much lower transaction cost. But whereas our, our initial approach works with like every L2 mm -hmm. um, and permits like, you know, let a thousand flowers bloom sort of approach, mm -hmm. um, this would require us to pick one. And I feel like it's too early to, to pick a single L2 as like this is where all .eth names live or at least where they live by default, you know. Yeah. Um, so we want to be a little cautious about like picking a winner there. But at the same time, we have this approach that works for, for reducing the fees enormously for most users without having to do that, you know, letting our users choose where they want their names to live. Yeah. And what's the time frame on that for um, with, with subdomains and, and things like that? We'd like to have something usable out by the end of the year um, is our goal um, with the interference of like the holiday season and so on. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, maybe that will be a little difficult, but we have like we have code that works and we need to polish it and we need to like make it work with a practical L2 rather than with our own sort of test environments and mm -hmm. stuff. Um, but I think that's achievable, probably initially not with like fancy UIs because that takes a little while to develop. So it might mm -hmm. be a little bit of an advanced user thing at first. Okay. Cool. Uh, and then the other thing I was going to ask about was just, um, oh, the, the grace period, just while we're talking about kind of like all of the mechanisms with ENS, the, the grace period of 90 days um, and and where that kind of came from, uh, the, maybe the DNS inspiration. Yep. Yeah, the, the initial idea was like, we don't want somebody losing their name because they were a day late to renew it or because they forgot about it. Um, so the, the idea was to give a fairly generous grace period during which they can still renew their name and retain it. Um, and so that people can't just, you know, snipe it out the moment it expires. Um, and, and the idea was to sort of restrict what they could do with it mm -hmm. uh, during that grace period, not like out of some sort of sense that it needs to be punitive, but to sort of because maybe that will provide a reminder that, oh, hey, things aren't working properly. In retrospect, there's not a lot we can actually restrict, and so that I'm not sure how effective that is. So it may have been more effective to to just have messaging around, like, now is the time you need to renew, rather than the grace period tacked on. Um, but I, I have seen it save people from, from losing their names, because maybe even just the psychological factor of basically we're telling you it expires 90 days before it actually expires, you know, <laughs> if you factor in the grace period, that gives people the enough time to have an oh shit moment and yep. fix it, you know, <laughs> before it actually goes out to the public. Yeah. And and then also just the pricing at for um, five characters and more ENS names at $5. Um, mm. Was there any kind of, was there a reason for five? <laughs> So I think the initial discussion was, well, most DNS names are about 10 bucks a year, mm -hmm. so maybe we should make it 10 bucks a year. And then somebody was like, well, ENS is really early, um, so maybe they're about half as useful as DNS <laughs> names, so we'll make them five bucks a year. Uh, I would say probably most people get a lot more use out of their ENS names now than, than maybe DNS names if they even have any. Mm -hmm. but. It served to be a reasonable sort of shelling point, you know, a reasonable tipping point. These days, uh, gas fees tend to be a lot higher than the actual cost to register unless you're registering for a bunch of years mm -hmm. at a time. And so, um, you know, I wonder how, uh, you know, clearly it's priced a lot below what people would be willing to pay. Yes. But the goal of registrations isn't to bring in massive amounts of income for ENS, it's to prevent like mass registration of names people won't use right and so i think for that it's set at a level that's you know low enough that it's noise to people with gas fees these days but mm -hmm. high enough that doing that isn't necessarily affordable mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And then in terms of the registration funds and what happens there, because it doesn't flow to the team, um, can mm. you just quickly walk us through how that works? Yeah. So like the there's some core functionality that requires permissioning in ENS2, mostly for upgradability, but also for the, the funds. And those have been controlled from, from day one by a group of seven key holders. Uh, I'm one of them, but the other six are all community members, not ENS team members. Mm -hmm. Um, and so they have the right to decide how funds are distributed and used and so forth. Um, and the, the overriding goal is like for the ENS ecosystem. But um, so far, like they, they haven't done a lot with them because I think there's a feeling that um, there's sort of a lack of uh, legitimacy to make decisions with large amounts of it. You know, mm -hmm. so it sort of accumulates, but it's like, well, would it be legitimate for us to spend, you know, a million dollars on public good X, mm -hmm. you know, do, do we have, you know, do we have that sort of mandate or are we just stewards of this money in, in sort of search of future decentralization where something with more of a mandate can, can decide more authoritatively what to do with it. So, so far, the only thing that's happened to those funds is um, we funded Gitcoin uh, to the tune of $700,000. Uh, which was nice. Uh, less nice was that it happened the day before Vitalik gave all his dog tokens to them, oh. so it kind of got overshadowed a little bit. <laughs> oh my goodness! Um, but that was kind of that was kind of out of a desire to like uh, pay back some of the the founding debt, if you like. Like you, the EF gave us very generous grants to get us going, mm -hmm. and we kind of wanted to pay forward to like help other parts of the community as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that would be a great motivation for for ENS funds in general is to help other public goods. Um, and the other thing that's happened is uh, a little while ago, like during the initial sort of 2021 bull run, uh, we sold a bunch of the ETH for USDC that still sits in the wallet, mm -hmm. just out of a desire to like, if there was a big crash, not end up, you know, with not enough money to, to continue to run ENS. Mm -hmm. um, but that's all that's been done with it so far. Yeah. Yeah, I, I feel like the ENS community is like particularly amazing. I look at the uh, website with the number of registrations and, and wallet holders and it is a huge number. It's over 100,000 now, right? Is that correct? Uh, of uh, registrations, yeah, by, by a long shot, I think. Oh, uh, so the number to... of active active wallets with ENS names? Ah, uh, right. Uh... Active wallets with ENS names is, yes, is over 100,000. I think wow. it's like 110,000 now. Yeah, incredible. So that would be like a, a huge community kind of to, to draw on for, um, yeah, deciding deciding what to do with the funds, which is really exciting, I think. And also just this idea of public goods. I feel like it's so obvious in especially the Ethereum ecosystem, like when you just the ripples from a single project from funding us and i mean ens is a perfect example of this and then see, seeing that go on to fund more public goods is um something i'm really excited about and looking forward to so yeah that's really cool okie doke nick thank you so much for your time i know that now i don't want to take up any more of your time i just want you to work on the subdomain name wrapper so that can get released because that is definitely something i'm really really excited about um and yeah and um i'm sure we'll talk again soon on another pod and thank you my pleasure thank you <laughs> okay